Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for another session of the Atlas Innovations from the Neurosurgical Atlas. My name is Aaron Cohen. Uh, this evening, we have a special group of colleagues who will be talking about the use of synaptive robot for microsurgery. I'm going, uh, I'm going to introduce them. The, our first speaker is Dr. Costa Hajipanayas from Mount Sinai um, uh, Hospital at, in New York. He is the chairman of neurosurgery there and also director of neurosurgical oncology. Uh, our next speaker would be Dr. Raj Nangunori. He is an attending neurosurgeon at Mercy Health in Rogers, Arkansas. And uh, last and not least is Dr. Peter Fetchy, who is at Duke University, who is an associate professor of neurosurgery and director of both brain tumor immunotherapy and center of brain and spinal metastasis. Um, the synaptive robot has been an excellent addition to microsurgery, really pushing the frontiers to the next level. And I'm really excited this evening for us to be able to talk about this new technology and how it can transform microneurosurgery to the new level. Thank you, Dr. Cohen Gadol. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be back here, and uh, it's, it's great to be back with uh, some new colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Nanda Nori and uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Peter Fetchy. So we're going to talk about um, our experience with use of the exoscope for resection of brain metastases. And, you know, we're able to include our series that we've had uh, completed here at Mount Sinai, and I'm going to include some patient outcomes that we've looked at with the exoscope. Uh, I do have a consulting agreement with uh, Synaptive, uh, and here are my other uh, my other conflicts, which are not related to this talk. So, whenever we talk about surgical resection of brain tumors, we always want to talk about how we can maximally resect the tumor, and in the case of cerebral metastases, we're really our goal is complete surgical resection. And, you know, we're going to talk about how the importance of visualization, magnification, and the use of tractography impact the ability to do that. Uh, I'm going to also talk a little bit about our, our conventional microscope that we've been using in neurosurgery for decades, which is really an amazing visualization device. And now with the exoscope, which we'll talk about today uh, in this um, uh, this group that we're, we're having together tonight. Some of the highlights that I feel are strong and, and really help in my practice uh, during surgery. And I do have a couple cases we can discuss, and then we can go over some of the outcomes with the, the sole use of the exoscope during surgery. A lot of what we do in, in neurosurgery is, you know, making openings in the skull so we can see things better. And, you know, this is a, a an opening in a wall uh, on a Greek island looking through and, and you see, you know, the Mediterranean Sea in the background and the, and the, the mountain. And, you know, you can see all different types of uh, visualization here in terms of, of the sea, the mountain, and, and different clarity through this opening and multiple different things are delineated. And, and the concept uh, really applies with everything we do during microsurgery. Um, and the other concept that's important is magnification. And this is that same, you know, island looking down off the balcony. You can see this beautiful yacht in the distance. And then, you know, you zoom in with your camera and you can see there's a small little boat in the back. So being able to see things at high magnification with high clarity and definition allows us to really understand uh, how to delineate things that we want to resect better. Um, the, the conventional microscope is something that we've been using. It's It's a... A tested, you know, visualization device that works, and we we've been relying on this for decades, and and you know we're all comfortable using that. But there are some limitations that we have to understand with the conventional binocular optical microscope, including uh, some of the, the the limited magnification available due to the optical lens, uh, the binocular view, and of course, you know, with this type of lighting. Uh, with the xenon light, there's always glare. Uh, with the image, it is what it is. You can enhance the uh, the the lens image that you have. You could try to overlay things on that, but it, you just cannot modify that image. And of course, it's confocal, not panoramic. Um, so you know, we also have the ability to see in 3D now with the exoscope, and I think that's really helped things 
Uh, now, and I've converted to basically all my surgeries to use the exoscope. Uh, and it's been a learning uh, curve for sure, but I have appreciated these qualities we've talked about. And then incorporating that with neuronavigation and whole brain tractography, in addition to the robotic arm, these are all additions to this visualization device that also include uh, voice activated control. So we'll go over through some of these features um, you know, with this presentation today. The zoom properties of the exascope uh, are just amazing. I mean, 12.5x zoom compared to the 6x zoom with the microscope and the field of view and depth are, are much better, much greater than the microscope. And the lighting is also quite impressive. You can see it's, it's a light emitting diode light and that's something that is different than the xenon lamp. So you really never need to go past 30% light intensity with the exascope, which is something that I find very intriguing. And then of course you could see the uh, 4K digital monitor. There was a small video here that played uh, as I was talking. You could see some of the cranial nerve anatomy uh, is quite nice. You know, uh, I really like the introduction, uh, if you don't mind me interjecting. Since yes. we're talking about the learning curve, uh, Costa, can you describe how you have gone through the learning curve for the beginners? Obviously, this video is for people who are thinking to use the device. We want to focus on the beginner stage of things. I know you are an expert in using it. So can you tell me at the beginning, how did you go through the learning curve to facilitate it? Yeah. Did you have to go to the microscope or change the strategy? I would really appreciate it. Yeah, so the strategy that you know I had taken with the uh, with my initial cases were really, you know, have the exoscope, use it, but have the microscope on standby, uh, sterilely draped and ready. Uh, and to be honest with you, the first case I did was a skull tumor. And, and that may sound, you know, something that's simple, but, you know, that's what I wanted to start out with. I wanted to, to focus on a skull metastasis and, and really understand its use. And when I started using the exoscope, there was no 3D version available. It was all uh, 2D. So, you know, I had to get used to operating uh, in, in 2D um, with, you know, the cases that I uh, operated with. But quickly, you know, I noticed that um, working in 2D, being able to see the tissues with more clarity, being able to magnify really helped me understand the depth. And then, of course, when 3D came, things became much better. So definitely, I, I would encourage starting out with more straightforward cases and then build up your confidence and your experience, you know, I would not start out splitting the Sylvian Fisher with the exoscope. I mean, that's just not a smart move. I would start out with something simple, maybe a, a, a low bar metastasis, something you know, that's straightforward, or like I just said, a skull, a skull metastasis, something that, you know, you could play around with the exoscope and, and, and really learn how to maneuver it uh, during the surgery. Okay, so this is a, a video that I had uh, taken recently of a brain metastasis case. But you can see here how well the tumor is delineated, and, you know, this is an on-block resection. So that's, you know, the, the visualization is, is quite nice and high def, uh, as you can see here. And then, you know, more advanced cases, you know, as, as, as you develop your, your skills with the exoscope is, you know, defining neurovascular structures, you know, in the Sylvian Fisher, uh, and, you know, doing these types of cases. But, you know, I think these are the types of cases you want to reserve for later, but you can see how beautiful, you know, the anatomy is, and you're using your same microsurgical instruments. So this is still microsurgery, uh, but you're not looking through a binocular scope. You're looking at the heads-up display. Okay, next slide, please. And, you know, I know that some of the other speakers will talk about the tractography, but this is a nice feature during surgery where, you know, this is a large subcortical glioblastoma where it's abutting the uh, medial cortical spinal tracts. And, and, you know, we use other types of modalities to, to define those pathways, such as subcortical mapping, but it's nice for preoperative planning, you know, so you can understand uh, prior to surgery how the extent of the tumor. And then during surgery with navigation, of course, you can also approximate where these uh, cortical pathways, subcortical pathways are involving and are adjacent to the tumor. The cranial nerve visualization in a posterior fossa case is just really textbook-like. Uh, you can see here, this is an epidermoid we took out 
uh, last uh, two years ago, and you could see just you know the cranial nerve seven, uh, eight, all the lower cranial nerves. Beautiful. You know we're here stimulating the nerves, uh, and you could really see quite nicely. And again, this is through a keyhole opening with an exoscope above your head, uh, which is just really remarkable at how well the magnification and lighting is for a keyhole opening in the posterior fossa. The arm is something that um, is, is kind of neat. You know, this is a case I was doing with my neurotology partner, George Wana, and you can see we're, we're doing the surgery together. And you could program the arm to go into different positions, but it has a quite, quite nice reach to it. Um, and, and can really position nicely in, in angles that you wouldn't think it could position. The concept of, of using an exoscope and, and understanding how it impacts comfort, surgery comfort, is, is an area that's actively being studied. You'll see there's papers coming out now really trying to quantify discomfort in the neck and the back. And, you know, looking straight ahead at a monitor, instead of straining your neck, flexing, extending, and rotating, certainly will have less stress on, on your joints. And I've appreciated that myself because the exoscope is doing the movement. You're looking straight ahead. You're moving the exoscope in the position that it should be. So, so really, you know, there's, a, there's some key strengths here with the visualization, magnification, tractography, the robotic movement, and then the engagement of the team is another concept that I've really appreciated with this because I think if everyone in the room is seeing what you're seeing well, the surgery goes so so much better in, in terms of flow because your 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 surgical tech is is right there. He sees what you need, what you're doing. The circulator the same way. She she or he is right there understanding the surgery, and then of course the the resident fellow medical student teams all engage, and it becomes a really nice uh, operative experience for everybody. Uh, in terms of education. So back to the learning curve a little bit. I think what I've appreciated is that, you know, if you have a little bit of endoscopy background, which I did during my training and my career, I feel that the exoscope is not that big of a jump. Uh, and most training programs have some uh, portion of endoscopic training, skull base or intraventricular. So I think that really helps with the exoscope in terms of getting up to speed. Uh, you know, I think understanding the positioning of the exoscope uh, is important. You know, I think also, you know, for skull based tumors, sitting and not standing is, is best. And we'll talk about that. And the robotic arm and movement uh, excursion limits are, are something that need to be understood. Uh, but there is this learning curve and it's going to come as you understand more cases. We publish some papers now and, and you know, this is use of the exoscope of lateral skull based surgery. Um, and we published some others with GBM outcomes. Uh, so, you know, we, we're, we're learning how to apply this and, and, and appreciate its use in different types of um, pathologies. And, and this is just the kind of the, the more shallow curve for those who have endoscopic neurosurgery experience versus the more steep curve uh, for those who just use the operative microscope. And the concepts here, you can just see, you know, you're, you're incorporating all your technologies in a heads up display. Uh, in front of you as you're looking straight on and the, the exoscope's really at your shoulder. Um, you know, this is a, a, a team approach. You can see everybody engaged here. And I think I actually caught our plastic surgeon who was helping us with the case snoozing here in this picture. Uh, but, you know, everyone's kind of looking at the screen in 3D and, and really part of the, the team and understanding what we're doing. The, the neat thing too is also you have all this information on the side here that's voice activated too. So, you know, you could zoom in, zoom out, you could turn the light up and down with your voice. Uh, you can't move it by voice at this point. You can go in and out of 3D, you could start the video recording. So it's, it's pretty nice in terms of those types of functions uh, during the surgery. So one of the nice features uh, when you start out using the exoscope uh, is this uh, voice command and I really enjoy this because it almost kind of sets the stage for surgery uh, and, and it's really just you know announcing with the exoscope voice control let there be light and all of a sudden you know the light comes on and then you could you know initiate other modes of action with the exoscope including zooming uh, including focusing you could also you know adjust the lighting so 
you know, these are things that um, are really kind of neat with the voice control. Uh, may I please ask, since you're talking about voice control, Costa, what are the workflow efficiencies that you think this is producing? Because obviously this is not something that is available in other robotic exoscopes. Could you elaborate further on that? Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I think, Aaron, the, the voice control features, I find them nice. I don't think they're essential. I think they are helpful. Um, you know, I, as a neurosurgeon, you want to do things immediately. You want to grab it. You want to focus it. And part of that is kind of our, our, our um, orientation with the microscope. You know, we grab the microscope. We, we focus it. You know, we, we move it around because we know we can do it quickly. So, you know, that's something that I learned with the exoscope is that, you know, we can have the exoscope do many of these functions with voice, voice control. So it's just something if, if you want to do it, it's there. Certainly you can grab the exoscope and move it how you want. Uh, you're still going to have to do that uh, without the voice, voice control. But it is nice to be able to, you know, turn the light on and then uh, use your pointer to focus. So that's something that uh, I do use routinely. But I am one to move it around manually more so probably than, you know, maybe what others do. And I just like to do that quickly. Um, you know, I think this is just, you know, some visualization of where the scope is in relationship to where I'm operating. You could, you could see that, um, you know, there's the, the, the tech is, is kind of right across from me. You could see that the, um, the exoscope is kind of right over my shoulder and, and it's, it's really out of the way. Yeah, th this is just another video highlighting some of the commands that you could do uh, with the voice control. So lighting, zoom, focus, 3D view, and, and you can really change the display for format as well. Uh, you know, posterior fossa case, CP angle tumor, a little bit more difficult, but you know, you're, you're positioning your patient the same way that you would otherwise. You, you, you have the, the monitors, you know, away from on the other side. Uh, and, you know, for this type of case, as you'll see, uh, I would sit, you need to sit down. So that's something that I've learned with the, the posterior fossa case with the exoscope. And then even with the microscope, we're sitting down for most of these cases. Uh, it just works much better because the endoscope's going to be above you. And the lighting works much better too, if you're, if you're sitting down. Uh, and this is one of my, my partners here, Dr. Zhou. Uh, this was actually her patient I was helping her with. But you can see the reach of the arm, how far out it goes out, and, and can really help you with your visualization. I'm going to highlight a couple cases. Just these are recent cases I did within the past month. Uh, this is the reason why I'm showing these cases is there's there's multiple brain metastases in these patients that we operated on with the exoscope, and I'm going to focus on this case, posterior fossa mets. This patient had this large vermian met that extended up to the tent. And then this left cerebellar met. So these are, you know, these are not uh, trivial mets. I mean, this is a, you know, a uh, uh, super cerebellar infratentorial approach to get to that vermian met. Uh, and we did, you know, a suboccipital craniectomy uh, to, to get to both. And this is the left cerebellar met that we operated on first. Uh, we wanted to operate on that one first to decompress the brain. And then we went after the, uh, the large vermian met. But I want to highlight this case because of, the positioning of the exoscope to look up at the tent. Uh, and that's something that, you know, for, for example, other cases in, in this region, so to speak, like a pineal region tumor, a sitting position is something that we traditionally were taught is helpful uh, or, you know, the uh, Concord position uh, with the microscope, but it is a reach, right? It's a reach and, you know, your neck strained. And, and with this case, again, the exoscope's doing the work. So this is just some video highlighting the left, the suboccipital craniectomy, just a standard suboccipital craniectomy we do for any of these approaches. Nothing fancy here. And then, of course, decompressing the left cerebellar metastasis. Um, and you can see just how nice that visualization is, that magnification. Um, you know, we, we were able to kind of gross totally resect this tumor and really come around it quite nicely. And, you know, you're doing microsurgery with this and, and you're, you're magnifying to see quite well and, and performing your standard uh, surgical technique. But it, it just provides a really nice view of the tumor delineation, you know, of the uh, of tumor from the surrounding brain. And, and just, you know, in my opinion, uh, helps with 
the surgery. So of course you could do this with a microscope. I'm not, I'm not here to say that you could not do that with a microscope. I think it's just, you know, in this specific case, I, I, I appreciate the fact that, you know, I would be able to take this tumor out, which is fine, but then go back after the, the higher uh, tumor that was, you know, right up to the tent from the vermis, uh, just behind the pineal region. And we'll get to that in a second. But you, know, you can see how well this delineates the tumor in the surrounding brain. Okay, we could probably move on to the next slide. So this is the view with the exoscope um, that you could see at, at the top of the tent. So you know, anyone who's operating in this region, you could see that the tent kind of uh, forms a, a tent-like formation. And that's why we call it the tent. And you know, right under this area where the tumor is, um, you know, is, is the, uh, the vein of Galen. That's how far posterior we are. But so I'm looking straight ahead at the monitor right now. I'm not, you know, my neck is not torqued. Uh, and you can see here that I'm able to kind of work on the tumor and, and really kind of decompress it. I could see the vein of Galen, you know, just uh, ventral to where I'm working. And it's just a beautiful view. And I feel very confident working here uh, doing my microsurgery with the exoscope. And this is his more uh, video showing uh, the tumor resection here. And we're, we're here at 80% zoom, and you could confidently see the tumor uh, and, you know, resect it well. Something else that I have been impressed about is that with these um, um, uh, exoscope, the the depth of field is so much more in terms of remaining in focus as you're working. With a microscope, you often have to bring your arm out, change the focus, get the instruments, go back in there again, unless you're using the mouth switch, which rarely people use, unfortunately. So I think there is a further efficiency, um, Costa, when the uh, machine or the robot <coughs> keeps the operative field in focus, for a good portion of the time as you're moving forward. Have you found that as an advantage compared to a microscope or not? Yeah, that, that's actually a very important point. And I agree with you completely. The, the, the depth of field doesn't require you to adjust it as much with the exoscope. Whereas with the microscope, we're continuously adjusting it to, to make sure that we get it where we want. And, and it does disrupt your flow. And I don't have to do that as much here. Um, you know, it's, 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 it kind of stays where it's at. You do your work. And uh, uh, while we are talking, I might as well ask this question. How has the adoption of uh, this robot adjusted your thought process of how to approach a surgery? Has that in any way changed the way you're doing a surgical approach because ergonomically it's more effective for you? Or is there anything at that high level that you feel this uh, the robot can contribute to yeah i mean i think with the robot we um we can program position so so in a, the next case i'm, I'm going to show you uh, another case with two mets and we can program you know up to you know i think it's five or six positions where you can come back to them and and you can you know really uh work in each of those regions that you had basically had the the modus memorized so in that respect, it really is helpful um, to, to kind of get it in a position that you like, memorize that position and come back to it later. Uh, and in the case of multiple brain mats, that can be quite helpful with the movement of the robot. Um, so, so, you know, putting the probe in, moving the robot to the tip of the, of the probe or a line of sight is quite helpful. And, you know, as you work with keyhole openings, some of these concepts become more important uh, on, on how you adjust the exoscope. So yeah, there is definitely the, the, you have to understand some of those concepts and, and really play around with it uh, as you maneuver to understand, you know, what you're comfortable with. So the, you know, these are just the MRI scans post-op and, you know, he's the guy with multiple brain meds, he's going to get radio surgery, but overall, you know, he did quite well. So let's see what happens, you know, with this patient. This is another guy that I recently operated on. I just saw him in clinic actually yesterday. He's doing quite well from New Hampshire. Uh, he has multiple brain mets from metastatic neuroendocrine uh, tumor, and he actually underwent prior radiosurgery and had enlargement of these lesions, 
And I just kept following them, and they were just getting bigger and bigger. He had this left uh, temporal lesion you could see here. They're not big. Uh, and then this right parietal, I'm sorry, left parietal occipital lesion that just, you know, basically doubled in size after radio surgery. And I was concerned, you know, is this progression? Is this radiation necrosis? He had a fair amount of edema associated with it, and it just didn't have that flame-like look for radiation necrosis. So we finally decided to go to the OR and resect this uh, recently. And, you know, we did two craniotomies. And, you know, our residents are each working on each of these craniotomies. Uh, so this was nice because, you know, the robot can move from one craniotomy to the next. And, you know, we, we first did the uh, left temporal lobe recurrence, and then we went to the right parietal lobe recurrence. And I think I could show you some video here where you could see that. And, you know, just be able to kind of maneuver between the two. And then this is the left parietal occipital lesion here that we worked on. Next video, please. And this is some video here from that left parietal um, brain met resection. But, but again, just a beautiful view, nice magnification, the exoscopes by your shoulder. And, you know, we're just able to kind of go in and, and clean this out. So he did have some treatment effect, uh, but he actually had recurrence in the left parietal occipital lesion that was found on pathology. The left temporal lesion was all treatment effect. So uh, you can see here, I just peeled off that tumor uh, from the surrounding brain. But uh, he did quite well out overall. And, you know, he's uh, going to go on to a new systemic therapy um, for his, his brain metastases. He's got a couple other small ones we're going to zap with radio surgery and, and, and kind of move them on. Okay, next slide, please. So I don't want to take up too much time. I know we're, we're running late here. Um, so, so just want to summarize, you know, this has been our series with brain mats. We have 31 brain mats resected entirely with the exoscope. And, you know, I think these were the majority were super tentorial, but we had, you know, about, about a quarter that were infratentorial. A lot of more eloquent, most of more lung cancer. We did look at extended resection data and post-operative complications and patient outcomes in this uh, series that we had. Uh, but pretty well represented with multiple different uh, cancer metastases uh, types. Our operative time was about 184 minutes. Uh, we had uh, an extended resection, median extended re resection of 100%, and about 20 of our 31 patients had complete resection of their brain metastases. So that was about 65%. Um, we had patients with multiple brain metastases. You know, three of the seven had multiple craniotomies. We had some, a, a low amount of blood loss. You could just see, see here some of our data from those patients uh, that I just uh, uh, went over. Uh, you know, these patients went on to radio surgery. Some had whole brain, but really just radio surgeries are standard of care now. And then, of course, systemic chemotherapies uh, as well. Um, when you look at some of the um, follow-up and, and progression-free survival, you could see at six months, 74%. Uh, they had a PFS of six months with 74%. And, you know, we had, um, we did have two postoperative hematomas. One had to be operated on. Uh, six had permanent neurologic deficits uh, that occurred after surgery. Um, here are some of our 30-day complications. And uh, the majority of patients were discharged home. We did have four that had to go to a skilled nursing facility. Our overall 12-month survival rate was eight, almost 84%. So I think that was that was nice to see in our group. Uh, we did have two patients that died during the six-month period after surgery. And our um, PFS 6 was, uh, uh, let's see here, 71%, 58 was overall progression-free survival. So I think we had eight patients that re were readmitted within 30 days due to uh, a post-surgical site infection, and then one had a DVT, one had a post-operative hematoma, one had extremity weakness and cognitive de decline. Um, Twelve patients had neurologic complications. Six were temporary, six were permanent. And um, we had about 61% that had no neurologic deficits. So 12 patients had no post-operative symptom complaints after their surgery. 
So, you know, retrospective study, but I think these are the types of studies we need to start looking at with our newer technologies to really showcase that, you know, hey, they, they do compare equally to our existing conventional technology. So that's something that we've been working on. Uh, of course, this, there's no comparison study with the microscope. So I'd just like to summarize my talk here so my uh, colleagues can move on with theirs. I think new intraoperative visualization te technologies are really essential as we move forward in neurosurgery. Of course, we have to keep our patients' best interest in mind with evaluating these new technologies. Uh, complete resection of our of brain tumors and brain mets is really the goal of surgery. And you know, we had we had a pretty good outcome in our series of brain met patients, and we feel that the complication profiles were comparable to the published literature on brain mets. So I think digital microscopy and use of the Xscope is really here to stay. I think start with a straightforward case and have the microscope as backup. These are just some pearls I'd like to leave you with. Take advantage of the high magnification capabilities and enjoy the high def and panoramic views. I mean, it, they're just beautiful. Position the exoscope so you don't adjust your head position. Sit for posterior fossa cases. And, and the 3D mode really helps with depth perception and manipulation of neurovascular structures. Thank you, Costa. Very uh, useful. Uh, I think as um, uh, just like anything else in surgery, the moment you get used to a device and you can use it, you're able to excel more and more. It's just making that transition. And, you know, surgeons are not really very good at transitioning to new things. When they develop habits, they really stick with it. Even if, they, if you give them something that works better, they still don't use it because they are such, you know... Um, sort of uh, conformal to their habits. And this is one of those, I think, uh, that if you use it and you get used to it, you see the abilities are more, but are you willing to make that transition? So before we go to the lecture with Raj, which I'm uh, very much looking forward to here, do you guys have any ideas how to make the transition from a microscope to exoscope more easy? Of course, you know, Costa, you mentioned the idea of uh, using the easier cases, have the microscope as a backup. But besides that, is there anything else Peter or Raj can add in terms of something that could help the surgeons who are so resistant to change make this transition time more easy? I would say I think that 3D has really been a major overhaul in that regard. Um, you know, a lot of my hesitancy, and I think others too, is that 2D view that you were originally afforded by the exoscope. And if you weren't someone who was used to using either endoscope or exoscope for surgery, uh, that, that could seem like a handicap. Um, particularly if the advantage in theory of an exoscope was that you wouldn't have to keep positioning it in the same way that you would have to position a microscope uh, frequently. But actually, as it turned out, because you didn't have the depth of view that you thought you, or depth of field that you thought you would have, the 2D view often did have to readjust, and so the advantage wasn't quite there. But with the 3D view, that's just not the case, right? And, and the goal of neurosurgery should be to have to not keep taking your hands in and out of a field. But each time you do that, you can uh, elicit an injury. And so now, not only do you not have that chance of eliciting an injury, moving your hands in and out of the field to adjust the microscope, but you have a 3D view and that capacity of not kind of ergonomically, as, as Costas was mentioning, uh, in your neck, et cetera. So I think that transition to 3D for me was really uh, the thing that uh, kind of got me over the hump with, with frequent usage. Raj, would you comment on that? Makes great sense to me, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, so it was interesting. When I was tr doing my residency training at Allegheny in Pittsburgh, we were fortunate to have the, the older school version, so we had the MODIS in 2D. So I did, a, I think I did... Uh, couple hundred hours with the MODIS in 2D, and one of my mentors was really big on using it because of the advanced visualization features. And I think the biggest thing I learned is if you want to try something new, stick with it. Uh, start, as uh, uh, Dr. Hajipanaya said, just with these simple cases, things that are easy. And the other thing, too, is also, you know, take your time. So if you're you know, a new surgeon or you're a resident or a trainee or, you know, even a seasoned attending, I think the biggest thing is, Block out a time so you're not trying to do three cases in one day. You know, spend that time 
learning the technology, becoming comfortable with it, with the ergonomics, because the way you use a microscope and the way you position it is very different, even for you know cases like spine cases. So I think understanding that and uh, taking the appropriate amount of time to learn the technology is the most important thing. I agree with you. Uh, something that re this robot could really be helpful in spine surgery because mm -hmm. I know two of my colleagues underwent spine neck, neck surgery uh, who both are spine surgeons because of the posture of their neck. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, I know this is not uncommon, the uh, musculoskeletal pain among spine surgeons even much more than cranial surgeons because, again, the neck posture. So this may be a good segue to talk, have you talk, Raj, and go ahead and let's get your uh, slides loaded, and I'm interested to hear your perspective. Absolutely. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Dr. Aaron cohen Godal, thank you for having me. It, it is really a distinction and a pleasure to be with my fellow colleagues here. Um, as a, as as uh, I was introduced, uh, my name is Raj Nanganori. I'm a attending neurosurgeon, uh, pretty much freshly minted. I work in uh, Mercy Health in Rogers, Arkansas. I actually did my spine fellowship at Cornell uh, in New York City with Dr. Roger Hartle, a minimally invasive and complex spine surgery. I also had the distinct privilege of training at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I was able to use MODIS uh, with one of my mentors, Dr. Alex Yu, uh, who did a lot of cases there. So I'm going to actually talk about the case use for the MODIS and the 3D exoscope and the spine cases, in spine surgery in general. So this is actually uh, the first, one of the first pictures of me actually using the MODIS with my mentor, as I mentioned, Dr. Yu in, in Pittsburgh. This was when we were doing an ACDF uh, with uh, 2D. As you can see, what's really nice is that we're both looking over each other's shoulder and the ergonomics, you know, as, uh, as we were talking about previously with uh, posture, you know, with an ACDF, depending on the level, sometimes you have to steeply angle the microscope. In this case, as you can clearly see, you're looking straight ahead and there's a neutral neck posture. Uh, you're comfortable uh, and it's very easy to, to visualize exactly what you want to see. Uh, so this is just kind of a throwback picture and I'm happy that this is here. Uh, the previous generations of MODIS, especially the uh, 2D version, I had a lot of trouble uh, with the spine cases in, in particular, particularly because of the depth perception. You know, I think that uh, with cranial surgery, uh, especially I was able to do uh, various cases as a resident, uh, such as skull-based tumors, uh, aneurysms, microvascular decompressions, and the transition for me uh, doing some of the maneuvers, for example, turning the corner when you're doing a microvascular decompression, it was a lot more uh, easy to grasp, so to speak, because those movements you tend to pick up with microsurgery when you're doing you know, cranial and skull-based surgery. But the difficulty that I found in spine was that the depth perception was even more important to go from superficial to deep. And that's what made uh, using the spine, uh, using it on spine cases uh, a little bit more challenging. Uh, we did do a lot of uh, ACDFs and anterior cervical, for example, corpectomies, but doing an MIS case uh, with 2D or doing uh, cases uh, just even like like an open laminectomy, sometimes with 2D alone, it was kind of difficult. But we did do the cases. Now with the 3D exoscope that I, I'm lucky enough to have at Mercy, uh, I've actually converted completely to using the 3D, whether it be uh, cranial cases uh, or doing open spine or minimally invasive spine, which is my interest. Uh, and so I do think that there is utility there. Um, there isn't an, an integration with spine navigation yet, uh, but I do think that uh, with, uh, I think, uh, Synaptis partnerships, I think that may be something on the horizon. And if you have an integrated navigation system, regardless of what company you use, uh, what is nice is that you can have the navigation screen separately and you can have the uh, visualization instrument in terms of the 4K monitor to be able to do your, uh, do, your, uh, do your case pretty effectively. The other thing that is nice is are the suction tips, which are navigated as well as the navigation pointer. So when you want to move to a particular uh, point in the field, you're able to just use a simple foot switch and be able to orient the scope in any sort of position that you need to without having to move, it, move the patient, which in spine, especially when you're doing cases like MIS, rather than rotating the patient, now you can rotate the scope and the mechanical arm in a better position uh, so you can actually visualize what you need to. This is a, a video basically just showing... Um, showing the movement of the scope. Obviously here I'm doing a tubular case, but what's nice is that, again, the scope is moving uh, rather than myself or having to move the patient. Let's 
see here. And this is a case we were actually doing the other day, myself and my partner. Uh, he's actually working right now. There was a young man, he was uh, 32, uh, had a very large uh, cervical disc herniation causing severe cord compression. Now, I even converted my partner into using <laughs> the synaptive uh, 3D, especially because he he's not a big exoscope fan, but when he saw the visualization, once he started working, uh, he, he actually liked it and he was able to, to use it pretty effectively. So, next slide. And again, another video here pretty quickly that plays, actually. And again, again, this here is to highlight the, sort of the ergonomics and the visualization, like I said, is, is second to none, especially when doing things like ACDFs, when you're looking to make sure that you're preparing the end plates appropriately uh, to make sure that you have a good surface for arthrodesis. So I think it's very helpful. It's also very helpful for drilling, for example, the posterior osteophytes, which, you know, for all of us that do anterior cervical discectomy infusion cases, sometimes there's a retrolisthesis, sometimes there's a lot of bony bridging osteophytes, which with the microscope, you can see them and you can do the work. But I do think that the enhanced depth of field uh, really helps to perform the surgical tasks quite, quite efficiently. And I'm going to move on to some uh, case presentations to just show you the kinds of cases that I think all you know, new attendings, especially if you're in general neurosurgery, we run into these all the time. And uh, as, as I mentioned before, because of having the modus at my disposal, I've been switching over completely. I don't really think I've, since, I, since we got the modus about five or six months ago, I really don't think I've used the microscope for any of my cases because uh, the 3D is excellent. Uh, so this first case is uh, pretty straightforward. It's a 55-year-old female. Her main complaint is of mechanical neck pain. So neck pain really at rest, worsened with motion. She described it as a sort of a grinding and clicking motion. And she had left upper extremity radiculopathy with pain rating in her left shoulder, elbow, as well as all of her fingertips uh, associated with dropping objects at times. Uh, she also had some uh, notable left upper extremity weakness and uh, multiple muscle groups. Uh, did have a history of smoking as well as a recent total thyroidectomy surgery. This is our MRI scan. As you can see, this is the uh, C5-6 level. As you can see, it's a fairly large disc herniation causing a face of the CSF signal there and, some, and cord compression without cord signal change. Again, this is the C6-C7 level. As you can see, again, the disc herniation causing left rather than right neuroforaminal stenosis and effacement of the ventral CSF space. These are her flexion extension films that you can see here, neutral at flexion and extension. Now, she didn't have any significant dynamic instability per my interpretation. However, because of the degenerative disc disease and because of the MRI findings, uh, she had failed conservative therapy, so I did offer surgery in the form of a two-level anterocervical discectomy infusion. So this is the, the video now, and uh, I'm going to have uh, the video sort of fast forward here a little bit. But as you can see, uh, I believe this is the uh, C5, C6 level. Uh, but essentially, you have the distraction pins, and you have the medial lateral blades. You can see the drilling that I'm doing, the, the drilling of, of the ossifites there. Uh, here, you see me preparing, you know, the end plates. Um, you know, with the naked eye, with loops, you can prepare the end plates quite well. But when you look with the exoscope or any kind of microscope, you'll see how much more you have left to prepare it well. Uh, I'm zooming in here actually to show you there's actually a delineation between the superior and inferior osteophytes. And uh, in a moment, you'll actually see me put an instrument there and you, you see that little line there, which is actually the cleavage plane. So when you're trying to drill down the osteophytes, it, you know, if you end up drilling incorrectly, you can actually drill into the body and you can get canceled bone bleeding, which is ideally not what you want. If, especially if you're putting a cage in because the concern is for graph subsidence. So the enhanced visualizations uh, is, again, it's really helpful here. Here, there's a nerve hook dissecting some of the posterior disc and the, some of the PLL. Um, you can advance the video a little bit further. You know, again, I'm using the kerosens to bite those osteophytes down. Um, and again, the, the, the goal here is to be able to visualize clearly, and you can see the dura kind of coming into view there um, slowly. Uh, but what's also nice about being able to see is you can tilt the scope to do not only the central decompression, but also the foraminal decompression. And in addition to seeing the vascular bleeding, which you'd encounter in the foramen, um, you can also see exactly, you know, how far out and you can see the proximal end of the nerve. Uh, another advantage here with the ACDF is the fact that you can directly visualize as you're putting the cage in, 
Uh, for those of us that use microscopy, uh, as you know, sometimes the microscope, with the way that it sits, it's very difficult to put the cage in and get a fluoroscopy shot at the same time to determine how deep you should put your cage. And when you're finished putting the implant in, you can actually see the, the hole, so you can plug it up with flow seal or bone wax, whatever you prefer, to make sure that you have good hemostasis of where you put it. And this is the final x-ray here, uh, AP and lateral, showing the three-month post-operative x-rays the patient had nearly complete resolution of her preoperative symptoms. She gained, regained function in her left upper extremity. She's very satisfied with the surgery. I was actually able to use her thyroidectomy scar. And uh, fortunately, that didn't uh, really uh, have too much of a bearing on how, how the surgery went in terms of the exposure. Um, Dr. Cohen, you have a question? Yeah, uh, Raj, enjoyed, enjoyed uh, watching your videos. Could you tell me, I see that you have the robot really way out of your way. Mm -hmm. What's the advantage of doing that? Could you talk a little bit about the positioning of the robot for the yeah. uh, spine cases? Yeah, in terms of, uh, do you mean in terms of how far out it is, in terms of uh, in relationship to the surgical field? Yeah, exactly. It looks way out of the way, and yeah. then the robot comes in. So can you just uh, describe the way you position the robot and why that is? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, the biggest thing for, for me, especially with these cases with spine, is you want enough working distance because in spine especially when you're doing, uh, whether it be the drilling or whether you're using the kerosene punches, you're often moving in and out of the field quite a bit. The mechanics uh, are such that you don't want, for example, the kerosene to hit the microscope. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've done ACDFs in the past where you have to zoom in super high and then your kerosene, especially if the patient is deeper, um, if you're using long kerosene, sometimes you end up having to you know, back your hand out and it ends up hitting the microscope, and that makes the ergonomics of the surgery a lot more difficult. So the advantage with the exoscope here is that you can stand it off far enough, you're able to get the work done and able to pass your instrument in and out of the field. And for example, if your scrub tech or your assistant is cleaning off your instrument, you don't have to worry about bumping into things. So that, I think that's the real advantage here. I'm going to move on to... Uh, the next case here, um, this, is a, this is a tubular case that I decided to do. This is a 50-year-old female, uh, chief complaint of low back and right leg pain. Her pain was primarily in her right buttock and posterior thigh, also wrapping around the anterior shin into the big toe at times. Um, not sure why it went back there. She had a weakness actually for several months and she had failed conservative therapy, uh, including epidural steroids, which only helped transiently with, before a return of symptoms. This is her MRI scan, as you can see here. It's sort of a parasagittal view demonstrating disc herniation causing compression of the right traversing S1 nerve. Um, so I'd offered her surgery in the form of, min of a minimally invasive tubular uh, laminotomy uh, and discectomy and S1 foraminotomy. So this is the surgical video here. Um, for, those of, uh, for those in the audience that haven't really uh, worked through a tube before, what, I'm, what you're seeing here is the right-sided hemilamina of L5. I'm basically using the bobie to cauterize and essentially try to find so the, the medial uh, edge or the spinal laminar junction. Um, there's a lot of soft tissue, especially at L5-S1. You can advance it a little bit here, the video. And as you can see here, I'm starting to do some drilling. Um, essentially, uh, once you drill down the lamina, you start to find the ligament. Um, I'm actually uh, taking a kerosene now and removing some of the superficial tissue uh, over the ligament here. And uh, actually below my kerosene is where the yellow ligament is. I'm using a ball tip to dissect some of that fat away. And you can see the ligament that comes into view there. Uh, next, I'm actually find, taking the kerosene and biting medially to find the insertion of the ligament um, because that's the easiest way to sort of uh, remove it uh, from the insertion and, and take it down. Obviously, because of the, the location of the disc herniation, I'm also doing some additional drilling again to find that rostral uh, insertion point of the ligament. I'm also drilling some of the lateral sort of facet joint uh, to, find, uh, to find the actual plane there. This is the nerve hook dissecting between the fibers of the ligament. You can start to see some epidural fat come into view. And again, the dissection. Again, here, what's, what's really nice is you can see the dura really in high definition. You see the epidural fat clearly. You know exactly where you want to use your kerosene to bite so you don't get, for example, like a spinal fluid leak. Uh, this is biting the top of the S1 lamina down, and you can see me palpating the S1 pedicle, so I know where the S1 nerve is. And you can see the S1 nerve laid out. You can actually see the uh, the sort of the common fecal sac as well, and I'm palpating again with the ball probe. Um, and there, actually, as I pull over the dura immediately, you see the disc herniation here. I'm taking my bipolar forceps and cauterizing it. And then, uh, then obviously, you'll see me cut in with a knife, 
and start to remove the disc uh, in fragments, uh, you have adequate decompression of the nerve. Now, uh, as we remove the, the disc pieces, some of it's quite tenacious. You have to kind of, as with uh, discectomies, you have to take as much as you can get. But what's also nice is as we remove the tubular retractor, you can actually cauterize the, uh, the muscle leaders and make sure that you have adequate hemostasis so that you prevent like a hematoma. Um, and so you can actually visualize as you're withdrawing the tube and uh, do an excellent job cauterizing the muscle and soft tissue as you remove the tube. You can advance the video a little bit. And this is kind of at the conclusion here. You see me withdrawing the tube and again, cauterizing the muscle uh, as we kind of exit and remove the tube. No, Raj, I think uh, you put it really well. I, I really like those different angles, the visualization. Uh, it seems like this would be a technology that potentially can help with avoiding the dural tears because, as you know, the most common cause of the dural tear is just you can't see, well, you know, the headlights don't get you there where you want and it's just you get frustrated and impatient and one leads to another. So I, I think the challenge really is going to be how you convince the spine surgeons, orthopedic surgeons or neurosurgeons uh, who, loop, who use loops Mm -hmm. to really convert to the exoscope. I think that is going to be the real challenge for them to see the advantages. And I think you put it really well in terms of how you discussed it. So I really appreciate it. Uh, Peter, Absolutely. we're very excited about your presentation. Um, very much looking forward to it. So let's jump in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, going to be a little bit of a shorter talk by comparison. Uh, and part of that's because I'm a little bit of a newer user of the technology. Uh, but uh, part of it's also because it's a, a pretty focal topic here. So what I'd like to discuss is kind of the use of Synaptive and, and just in general, uh, fiber tracking, etc. cetera, uh, in the kind of surgical preservation of white matter tracks. And, and this is really, for, for those of us in the brain tumor side of things, this is an increasingly important topic in neurosurgery, particularly as we realize the importance of preservation of white matter, uh, which is quite a bit less resilient to injury than is uh, it, even the cortex. So uh, with that, uh, again, to reintroduce myself, I'm, I'm Peter Fecci. I'm an associate professor of neurosurgery at Duke. Uh, I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you, and I appreciate uh, being able to speak alongside really an outstanding um, cadre of speakers in, in both Raj and Casas. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, and thank you, Aaron, for, for bringing me on board. Um, so with that, uh, I'll start this, uh, this talk. Uh, so I, I, this is actually going to be just really some case presentations to drive the point at home, uh, to drive the points home. And, and I'll go through it uh, in a little bit more detail. There's just two cases, uh, and I think they both reflect various aspects of what's important here. So I'll walk you through a couple of the case details. Uh, the, first, the first case is a 64-year-old right-handed man uh, who had been diagnosed with GBM at, at this point uh, just, just a, a little while before uh, and had, had a subtotal resection uh, at an outside hospital, chemo radiation, and then a very complicated course, actually. So uh, reoperation, intracranial hemorrhage, and rococcus infection. Uh, ultimately had to have a decompressive uh, craniectomy and then placement of a titanium mesh because the bone had been involved. Uh, and so, again, this was all in another hospital. It came uh, with basically radiographic progression, uh, consistent to sarthria and global left-sided numbness and weakness that had persisted since his original surgery uh, and had been getting images, of course, that then demonstrated uh, fairly substantial radiographic progression ever since the time of surgery. Obviously, the differential diagnosis here was treatment effect versus disease progression. Um, uh, he initially actually was referred to me for consideration of a lip procedure, but uh, ultimately the, the fact that he had a titanium mesh overlying this obviously precluded being able to screw a bolt into that area. Uh, and uh, we therefore recommended a resection. Uh, and this was uh, one of my uses of the Synaptive platform with the 3D, which has really uh, actually, I, I think, started to launch my, my use of this uh, for reasons that we'll discuss a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, if we're if we're going to do the craniectomy or craniotomy here, uh, we also planned a synthetic cranioplasty for him, which would be a lot better than the titanium mesh. So this is his preoperative imaging. Uh, as you see here, the, the relevant scans, of course, the contrasted images in the middle and on the right. Uh, you can see an axial and a, and a sagittal here. Uh, this is a right-sided contrast-enhancing lesion. 
And what you can see is that it's pretty much nestled around the uh, central sulcus here. So, and you'll see some more images of that pretty soon that, that reflect that. Uh, but basically, the motor fibers here are relatively anterior and deep to it. It's just underlying the central sulcus, uh, which ultimately turned out to be our access point. Uh, and so, you know, you've got motor right alongside here. Uh, and the relevant fact here is that you want to be able to monitor your corticospinal tracts throughout surgery, uh, both from DTI imaging and, and navigation, but of course also from things like cortical and subcortical mapping. So I'm going to play a video here that just reflects the capacity of, of, uh, of MODIS and, and Synaptive to provide really excellent, uh, uh, essentially, imaging of the white matter tracks. And, and the difference between this and some of the other platforms you may use for navigation here is that rather than having to have yourself, a radiologist, or even a rep, uh, essentially design or, or implement the fiber tracking for you and spend time doing that, the auto segmentation actually allows you to see the individual tracks uh, without having to do that. It, 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 it bases it based on functionality. And you can see there in that last image that you could very easily see the corticospinals and the arcuate fasciculus on both sides. Uh, and they're very beautifully identified with very high resolution imaging. And so that's really a tremendous advantage of this system. Perfect. Uh, so if we look at what some of the kind of raw images that you get through the DTI, uh, and, and we are now in the habit, by the way, of obtaining essentially DTI imaging for all of our tumor procedures. Uh, and that kind of provides us the flexibility of doing, you know, first off, providing information on, on relevant anatomy uh, and, and learning to understand the uh, how, how fibers may be displaced. Uh, I, I think it's also quite relevant, by the way, to get post-operative DTI imaging now. Uh, because it provides you a really nice, at least anecdotal and probably eventually academic uh, uh, ability to assess what you saw intraoperatively and what you found through mapping, through intraoperative imaging, et cetera, through, through awake craniotomies and, and what you saw there uh, with your mapping procedures as well. It allows you afterwards to see just how close you were uh, and to, give it, to get confidence, I think, with your ability to determine intraoperatively where you are and, and, and ensure that you're performing a safe surgery. So here you see the raw images and what you can obviously see here and, and what you'd anticipate from even the preoperative scans that we saw before is that the corticospinals here run anterior in the sense that this is again underlying the central sulcus a bit uh, and then also deep. And the coronal I think is probably the best way of seeing that. Of course, those of you familiar with DTI will recognize that the corticospinals uh, typically are colored blue uh, because blue typically represents basically a superior to inferior directionality of the fibers. Uh, and that is obviously going to imply corticospinal fibers here. Uh, and so this is a lesion that was essentially a progressive or recurrent GBM, which uh, and had undergone radiation. So those are obviously not necessarily fun surgeries uh, and is sitting right along the corticospinals. It's going to be radiated. It's going to be scarred. Uh, so this is somewhere where you really need to be accurate with your resection uh, and with your, with your motor mapping. So uh, whole brain tractography and auto segmented CST, you see that here. Uh, these are the types of images that Synaptive is able to provide. Uh, and on the left, what you're seeing are all of the white matter tracks that you might be interested in. Uh, but the nice thing is that as you auto segment, you have the capacity, again, without you having to do all of the legwork that you might normally have to do, to see the individual fiber tracks based on the function you'd like to preserve. So in this particular case on the right, what you've seen is our ability to first off define the object. So the yellow object there, of course, is the tumor, but then also to isolate the particular fiber track of interest. In this case, it's the corticospinals. Uh, we're in the non-dominant hemisphere here. So the arcuate fasciculus, which if we were on the dominant side, which would be quite relevant, uh, is, not, is not identified for us here. Uh, but if you go back to the uh, you know, back to the images on the, on the left here, uh, you can see where those would be present. And, and certainly you could easily introduce those or the optic radiations or anything else that you'd like to uh, individually place back and remove uh, to ensure that you're uh, plotting a proper trajectory with your surgery and also aware in space and time where your fibers are relative to your resection. And there are a variety of other advantages. Uh, certainly in the talks you've had so far, uh, you've seen a lot of information regarding the advantages both ergonomically and visually of the synaptic system and platform in the operating room. Uh, I think it, uh, this is, provides a very good picture of kind of a typical OR setup. Uh, you can see each of the folks here are wearing 3D glasses, although for the purpose of this uh, picture here, you can, you can see that there's still a very uh, kind of non-3D image. Uh, in other words, you're able to actually see it in 3D yourself. 
on the left uh, of the brain. And what's really nice here, as I think has been touched upon, is that everybody in the operating room is able to see in very large 55 inch format what's going on uh, with beautiful optics. It provides not only a great opportunity for you ergonomically to look straight ahead and not have to crane your neck with a microscope, but also for everybody in the operating room to be able to watch what's going on for your scrubs and your techs to be able to anticipate your next moves uh, because they can see in, in very large format and very clearly what's what's doing. Uh, students, it's a great training platform. Residents, great training platform, uh, depending on what level they're at, uh, as far as being able to very, very clearly see what's going on in the surgery. Uh, you know, no longer do you have that kind of third person in the OR who's unable to look through the microscope and is looking through a tiny screen on the side of it. Everybody's looking in 55 inch format uh, and able to follow the case beautifully. Uh, and the quality of images, of course, are fantastic. It's also nice, I think, it's, it's an advantage that I hadn't realized until I began using the platform more, to be able to have those images side by side with your navigation platform. Uh, so it, it's really nice to have that kind of split screen format where you're visually seeing the surgery, but also seeing where you are relative to your white matter tracks immediately opposite that, uh, as you can see pictured here in this mock-up of a, of a typical OR. Uh, so I think there are really some nice advantages here. Uh, those of us in the quote unquote video game generation, of course, it's, it's very easy for us to look not at our hands and, and do what we're, uh, and, and perform the surgery while we're looking up or, or to the side. Uh, and maybe perhaps that's what I think gets a little bit, it takes a little bit of getting used to for, for folks not accustomed to that. But I think overall, uh, that's really not a hard uh, workflow to, to get used to. I think the, the ultimate advantage here is now being able to see in 3D. Uh, and as you can see, all the folks in this picture are wearing those 3D glasses. Uh, and with the rare exception of one resident that I had who for some reason just could not see in 3D, uh, overwhelmingly, it was really an advantage to folks to be able to, to have that depth of field uh, and be able to see what you're doing without having to take your hands out of the field and repetitively uh, move that microscope. Uh, and I, I think we talked in the discussion of one of these other presentations recently about that, that danger that there is in neurosurgery, how it always has to be a goal not to keep moving your hands in and out of the field where you can do harm. Uh, you know, people moving their hands underneath the microscope, not being able to tell where they're coming in and, and knocking something uh, or injuring something. That's really not, uh, you have such a wide view here, that's not an issue. And because you don't have to constantly adjust things because of your depth of view and your width of view, uh, you reduce the risk of injury to, uh, to the patient. So I think th these are some of the major advantages uh, of the system. Uh, and you can see that I think and imagine that just by looking at the pictures that you see here. Uh, the video that we're going to play here gives an idea. So this, this is the exoscopic view. This is the, the type of clarity. Uh, this is obviously a, a fairly high zoom here. And what you can see is that the lesion that you had seen was underlying the central sulcus. So as you can imagine, well, we were going to do some sleep motor mapping. What you see us is placing the strip underneath the dura here so we can do a central sulcus mapping. Uh, and uh, we were able to do that. And we figured out that uh, basically we're, as expected, underlying the central sulcus in the middle of the field here. This is, of course, a, a keyhole case, a small opening. Uh, where we're simulating there uh, is actually uh, the precentral gyrus. And then the initial stimulation adjacent was the postcentral gyrus to the right there. Uh, and uh, uh, because uh, uh, I don't have any arachnoid knives that uh, cut, uh, I'm forced to use a, a 4 to uh, to open up the arachnoid here. It's also kind of radiated and scarred, as you can see. Uh, but we're able to essentially open the arachnoid uh, uh, overlying the central sulcus. And what you'll see very quickly here as we open that arachnoid is that you get a beautiful view of what's a, a fairly soupy recurrent GBM underneath. Uh, and, and you can see also here that you've got a couple of people working at once. You know, the resident's able to do a lot of work with a good view here. Uh, and, uh, and you've got a nice view of, uh, of the tumor immediately underlying that, uh, that arachnoid there. Uh, and, and you can see the quality of image that is obtained, and you can see my resident here uh, obtaining a, a biopsy specimen to send to pathology, uh, struggling a little bit, but ultimately doing pretty well. And I think that uh, you know I, the key here is that you can see the, the really beautiful images that you're able to, to get, uh, and you're able to share that with the rest of the operating room on the, on the big screen. So, okay, I think we can return to the slides and, and move on. You can obviously see the resection ongoing here. Perfect. So 
the key here is that, uh, you know, that, that showed the kind of quality of image uh, and some of the advantages of the system. But I also think that it's important to talk about some of the, the quality of the actual white matter tracks that you receive specifically with the synaptic platform uh, and with the auto, seg auto segmentation platform. Uh, and we did a little bit of an experiment uh, when I was kind of early in my use of the platform to compare our ability against other um, navigation platforms to properly see the white matter tracks and, and to see how they mapped. Uh, you know, one of our concerns always is that white matter tracks, of course, tend to drop out based on how they're determined if there's a lot of edema in the area. And I think that Synaptive has found a way to make that less of an issue. Uh, and so uh, I think this case in particular is a really nice demonstration of just how reliable uh, and how predictive the, the fiber tracking and auto segmentation that you get to the Synaptic platform can be. Uh, and I chose this case as you'll, as you'll very clearly see why in, in a few minutes to demonstrate um, uh, the importance of having accurate information here. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll walk you through the patient presentation. This is a 30-year-old right-handed female. Uh, she had a newly diagnosed T2 bright, flare bright, non-enhancing lesion in the right frontal lobe, very adjacent to face and hand motor areas. Uh, obviously, based on that description, we're concerned for low-grade glioma. Uh, somewhat aside, she had a history of a variety of autoimmune syndromes, uh, and she had presented with seizures affecting her, her left side. Uh, and we opted to do a craniotomy using the Synaptive platform, but we this was in early use, and so we really were in the habit of trying to compare the data we were getting here from the data that we were typically used to getting. And so we did so, uh, but we, we had committed to using the platform and, and to using a sleep motor mapping, which is my norm. Of course, that can easily be done awake as well. Uh, and then to use an intraoperative MRI here for, for the low-grade glioma. Uh, I'd like you to see the preoperative images. Uh, and again, here you can see some auto segmentation. So if you look at the middle and right-sided image, what you're looking at, of course, is a T2 MRI. And on the right side of the patient and on the left side of your image, uh, you can see in that middle image a, a, a reasonably sized T2 hyperintense uh, lesion that's exophytic uh, and, of course, pretty consistent with a low-grade glioma. And if you look at the image on the right, uh, what you can see is that there's a, um, uh, a, a very kind of superior view of that. And you can see kind of a little hint of T2 brightness uh, and you can see the auto segmentation that we've performed here. We've, we've just brought in basically the arcuate fasciculus on that side, uh, as well as the, um, uh, the uh, corticospinals. Uh, so I think if, you, if I advance this, I should get a little animation here. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to do it again. And if you look at these white boxes that I've demarcated for you, what you'll notice all the way on the left uh, when, when we're doing the 3D auto segmentation there is that even though most of the corticospinals appear to be running deep to the lesion, uh, which is, again, perhaps not surprising, you see them uh, in the raw DTI images in the middle doing that, you can see that there's this area where the, where the fibers perhaps run through uh, or even over the top of the lesion. And I think that that shows itself pretty well in that axial image on the right, uh, where you can see some, some corticospinals, the blue fibers, apparently running through that area of T2 hyperintensity that they're superimposed over. And the question here is, you know, is that artifact? Uh, because I will tell you that when we looked at the, our typical fiber tracking using our other navigation platform, uh, we didn't see those fibers there. And so the question is, you know, which is more accurate? Was, was the navigation platform that we would typically use more accurate? Uh, and this is just artifactual and kind of oversensitivity of the platform. Uh, or was this accurate? Uh, and perhaps the other images were subject to dropout uh, that uh, honestly, you know, provided us a risk of missing this functionality. Well, surely the way to confirm this would be to do some intraoperative mapping uh, and to take your resection essentially to the wall and see what type of subcortical and cortical mapping results you get. As you can see in the middle image here, there's a T2 bright lesion that's underlying two gyri. Uh, and we really probably needed to enter through both gyra to get a good complete resection because the lesion really came to the surface. Well, unfortunately, that posterior gyrus that you see in the middle image there that's overlying the lesion uh, turned out to be face motor. Uh, uh, but if we found a spot that mapped negatively at the inferior portions of that underneath the areas that mapped positively that we were able to, to kind of make a small corsectomy and enter. And then we entered through the, um, uh, through the anterior gyrus there as well so we could kind of get the lesion surrounded. 
Uh, and what we were able to, to, to do then was using kind of our subcortical mapping as well, continue our resection, uh, taking it basically to the deep borders. Uh, and we were obviously cognizant that we, uh, of where face was in kind of superior to where we entered. Uh, and we knew where hand was too, because we were, we were doing a sleep motor mapping. Uh, and we had, uh, we were using a, a strip that, uh, that kind of was able to stimulate and switch between channels and see where each was. And we performed our subcortical mapping with a monopore simulator. Uh, we were able to pull our distance to, to face motor to within two millimeters. Uh, and we, at that, at that exact point, were about five millimeters from hand, which of course was more superior to that. And we were somewhere towards the superior margins of our, our resection intraoperatively. And we recognized that there was still tumor present superiorly. Uh, and as I started to peel away at that tumor, you know, I was getting to that point where I was now within a millimeter and closer to face. And then inevitably we started to have diminishing of our face, our face motor signals. And we were now within just a couple of millimeters of hand fibers. Uh, and so we determined that really this was a time that we had to stop, uh, which is an important point because this is not a GBM where I think everyone are, uh, is able to say the tumor is not functional. When you're resecting a low grade glioma, you have to be cognizant that there may still be some functional components to that tumor. Uh, in this particular case, the, the frozen was uh, likely oligodendroglioma. Uh, and, and we really came to a point in the tumor where we couldn't go any further, where we really risked losing motor function. Uh, and I'll add that she woke up and was dysarthric for a period of days, uh, consistent with some transient facial weakness. We had taken it right to the wall. Uh, but her strength resolved over the ensuing days, and, and she, the dysarthric resolved, and her face became full strength over the next week or two. Uh, I'll walk you back through these images real quick. Uh, and so really there are key points here. And, and I, I think this was a really nice, although anecdotal and end of one type test. Uh, and so, you know, only modestly scientific, it really did provide me a lot of confidence in the system for a couple of reasons. And I think there are some key take homes here overall, uh, just based on surgical principles for gliomas, uh, in, in this particular instance, uh, I, you, you had a, a talk earlier on metastases, but also on the role of GTI and then, and the importance of using multiple modalities to ensure the safety of your surgery. So when we look at the DTI that uh, we provide or that we looked at rather to, um, uh, to plan our surgery and the auto segmentation feature of the Synaptive platform, it's important to recognize that that's important, uh, but it can also be used in combination with other platforms. Uh, and in, in this case, intraoperative functional mapping, intraoperative MRI, uh, all of these together can optimize your surgical outcomes. So in other words, we're receiving data from multiple sources that is providing us confirmation that the surgery we're performing is safe. Uh, and you know, if we're unclear on why we're seeing white matter tracks in, in, some, in some platforms and not in others, Things like uh, functional mapping, et cetera, are going to allow us to, to obtain the best outcome. I think another important lesson here is that while tumor generally implies non-functioning tissue, this is certainly not always the case with low-grade tumors in particular. Uh, and so it's not simple enough to say, well, I'm just going to go in and get the tumor out, and I don't really have to worry with, about what's around me because as long as I stay inside the lines, so to speak, I'm going to be fine. That's just not the case. Uh, it, it's, it, it's crucial to understand where you are relative to your white matter tracks, uh, whether or not those white matter tracks may actually involve portions of the tumor, particularly in the instance of low-grade tumors, and also to be able to be confident in your capacity to functionally map intraoperatively and to use tools like IMRI to ensure safety throughout the procedure. And really, that brings home another point, which is that increasingly we are being granted multiple ways uh, from a variety of technological platforms to apply essentially a belt and suspenders approach to confirming the presence of functional tracks in or near our field. And so we now have a variety of tools and we don't have to marry ourselves to just one. And we can use multiple tools intraoperatively to ensure safety. And this allows you to both trust and verify. Uh, so uh, in, in kind of researching that quote, uh, which we say all the time, uh, I hadn't realized that actually that was a quote by Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. But what I'm really advocating is that it shouldn't be trust but verify, it should be trust and verify. In this particular case, we now have multiple technologies that we can use in order to ensure safety. And, and I would also um, drive home the point that if you injure your patients, particularly in brain tumor surgeries, people forget going back to the shoot protocol, for instance, that 
The folks that didn't receive any benefit to their standard of care treatments after surgery were folks who either underwent biopsy only or folks who had low performance indexes. And so if you injure a patient and reduce their KPS and their functional outcome after your surgery, you're essentially obviating the benefit that they're going to receive from the standard of care treatments after that surgery. It becomes absolutely crucial to preserve patients' function if you're going to even provide them the benefit of standard of care. So I think it driving the point home, having this type of visualization, having this type of auto segmentation, being able to combine it with other modalities that we now are able to use, uh, like functional tracks, et cetera, like, like uh, auto segmentation, uh, intraoperative mapping, et cetera, uh, really is, I, I think, the, the key point of our surgery and, and really is the thing that allows us to, uh, to provide safe surgeries to our patients. So... Uh, with that, uh, I'll conclude, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, really nice addition. Uh, it proves the point again, just because we are surgeons doesn't mean we know the anatomy to know where the fibers are, because really they can be displaced, and the trichrography, especially uh, when it's married with navigation, it's a significant addition. Yeah, I think for me, what it's done, and particularly with some of the validations we've performed intraoperatively, is it's provided me more confidence in the tools that I'm being handed. Um, you know, I think with that validation I showed you functionally there, uh, it, it seems like it wouldn't be an exciting thing of sorts, but it was exciting to see that those little strands of fibers that it wasn't clear what they represented on the initial imaging, uh, really we were able to functionally validate intraoperatively. And that, again, I, I, I would say as a comparison, I, I very rarely even use something like functional MRI. Uh, I mean, because I don't trust the sensitivity and specificity. Really, the only reason I ever use functional MRI anymore is as a lateralization. So if I have a left-handed patient and I want to know which side speech is on, that's when I'll get an fMRI. Otherwise, there's no part of that imaging that's going to preclude me from just simply intraoperatively mapping. So I just, I just wouldn't trust it. And here... This is, I think, an advance in the types of information we can receive from imaging that has actual functional implication and functional suggestion uh, in the auto segmentation feature and the white matter tracks we're seeing, because I kind of know where those attachments are cortically are going to be important. And I also know, looking at those fibers, what their functions are going to be. And now we've validated intraoperatively that what we're seeing with those tracks uh, is exactly what we anticipate them to be. Um, now, I would never do it in isolation. I wouldn't eliminate things like intraoperative mapping, for instance. But I do think that we're beginning to trust more and more what we're being shown. And that is an absolutely, I think, crucial advance in our ability to feel safe as we operate. Well, I want to thank all of you guys for your valuable time this evening. I want to thank all the viewers who stayed longer to uh, watch this presentation. And uh, we look forward to working with you in another session in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.